Okay, welcome to Skull Sessions. My name is Mike Sindoma, Program Director and CEO at Sports Medicine Concepts and your host for Skull Sessions. Uh, I have a very special guest joining us today uh, for our special Athletic Training Month edition of Skull Sessions. Our guest today is the infamous Ronnie Barnes, New York Football Giants Senior Vice President in charge of medical services and head athletic trainer. Uh, Ronnie, I'm, I'm honored to have you join us here today. Thank you for taking some time to, to, to spend with us. My pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure how infamous I am, but certainly I've uh, been at the same spot for uh, any number of years, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Oh, thank you. And and we're going to get to that uh, as far as the time frame that you've that you've been with the Giants. But uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that story as well as all of your perspectives on um, all things athletic training. But I first want to share a story about the first time. I formally met you. I don't know if you remember this or not, but it certainly sticks with me. So let's go back uh, 11 years to about 2010. Uh, and we're at the Professional Football Athletic Trainer Society winter meeting in, in Indianapolis. And uh, a colleague of mine, Tony Surace, and I presented during that winter meeting. And we brought a whole bunch of equipment with us and we went over football equipment removal techniques and spine injury assessment and, and those types of things. And I remember that day and, and always will because that was my first engagement with PFATs and, and the professional football athletic trainers. Um, and we were up doing that presentation. It was early in the morning and I think you guys hadn't quite woken up yet. Uh, and we're doing our presentation and there's not a sound in the room and, and no one is engaging, no one is taking, you know, no one is really interacting with us. And I thought, I thought to myself, I, multiple times in my head, I'm like, we're, we're circling the drain here. You know, here we are, we have a chance. We're standing up in front of all these people that I have a profound respect for and we're circling the drain. We're, we're not providing them anything that, that is of value, educational value. Uh, so we. About an hour into it, we took a break and uh, went out. Everybody got some coffee and some brownies and stuff like that. And I told my friend and colleague, Tony, I told him that exact thing. And I had this burning in the pit of my stomach. And it was, it was I told Tony, I said, you may have to take over this presentation because I've just got this anxiety and, and this burn in my stomach. I said, we're circling the drain. You may have to take over on this. Turns out you guys just weren't quite awake yet. You came back from the break. Everybody had a brownie, a donut, some coffee, and then some engagement started. We finished our presentation on a very high note. And when we finished that presentation, you were one of you were sitting in the front row, just off to my left. I remember it very clearly. Um, and you were one of the first people I came in contact with as I came down that little stage from from doing the presentation. And I knew I knew immediately who I was talking with. And you were very kind, and you said uh, something to the effect of, that was a great presentation. Uh, we'd love to learn more and, and possibly have you come out and do some training with, with, uh, with the New York Giants. And I remember leaving, and I remember thinking, you know what, he's just such a nice guy. He, he just said that to be nice. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to expect a whole lot more. I think he's just being nice. And lo and behold, we, we connected after that. And what a great relationship we've had since then, 11 years. And I think there's only one year out of that 11 that we haven't been with the New York football giants to do emergency response training. And that was the strike year. Uh, and, and I think other than that, uh, it, it's been a great relationship, but I'll remember that day uh, for, forever. Well, Mike, what, what you do in emergency response training is so important to what we do and what we might be faced with in, on the field um, and witnessed by so many people uh, around the country and around the world um, that uh, the training that you do and, and that you give us year in and year out is so important. It's important for all athletic trainers, primarily because it's not a skill that we skill set that we use every day. Um, and the pressure as you so aptly do it is so, so important. And you, you always seem to bring new ideas, new concepts, uh, new guidelines, uh, and up-to-date information. And Mike, that's so important. That's not a commercial. That's to say that what you do saves lives and limbs 
or it teaches us to do that. Um, and we're very fortunate to have uh, you and, and your colleagues do that for us on an annual basis. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, very much appreciate that, uh, those kind words. But let me, let me get to your story because I think that's what people want to hear. Uh, tell us uh, how you landed in the NFL. I think that's just a, an, an unbelievable story, how you ended up even working in the NFL. How, how did that start? Well, Mike, I don't think I could tell an NFL story without telling the story of my training. And I started out at East Carolina University as an undergraduate student uh, in the curriculum program. And while I was there, uh, they started an athletic training curriculum. Uh, I, I became the first graduate of that curriculum uh, and remained at East Carolina for uh, almost two years uh, as their first assistant athletic trainer. And I worked football, basketball, and baseball, and I traveled with many of those teams. I uh, certainly traveled with the football team, traveled the baseball team, and traveled with other sports as they needed me. Uh, we had a, a host of student athletic trainers, uh, but there were just two of us, myself and, and Rod Compton, the head athletic trainer at that time. Uh, after graduating from that program and staying on as an assistant, I went up to Michigan State University to work with Clint Thompson. You may remember him. He was the editor in chief national the journal of athletic training for so many years throughout most of his career uh, and a real mentor and a, a great person and, and i you know i went from one division uh, one school to a, a, another division one school but the, the resources and the athletic program certainly at michigan state was uh, greater and, and more enormous uh, than i had come from at east carolina and i learned so much there uh, fantastic opportunity for me. I was assigned primarily with football. I enjoyed wrestling, so I went with that sport. And those athletes were fortunate to have an athletic trainer that it was just wonderful uh, to, to engage with them. Uh, while I was there, um, in 1976, I think I may have still been at East Carolina, um, the New York Giants did not have college-educated athletic trainers, although they had some very skilled athletic trainer. So they were lacking in rehabilitation and in just some of the um, advances in sports medicine. And, and I was asked to come and uh, on, on, on an internship basis, referred by uh, John McVeigh. Um, John McVeigh had discovered me through some folks around the country. It turns out uh, he discovered me from a conversation he was having uh, with someone at Michigan State. I didn't know that Michigan State had their eyes on me to come there, but clearly uh, before I got to Michigan State, I, I went to uh, spend a summer uh, with, the, with the Giants. A certified athletic trainer, uh, worked very well with uh, their two full-time athletic trainers. Uh, and I went back from 1976 in the summers to 1980. Now, football programs at major universities today are year round. I don't think I'd be able to do that now, uh, but I was able to, um, to go uh, in early July um, to New York uh, and work with uh, over a hundred players that they had in camp at that time uh, and assist those athletic trainers and assist them in setting up a, a modern day sports medicine program. That was a real challenge. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they accepted me, I accepted them. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, the first year I went was, uh, it was 1976, and that was the year of the centennial. Uh, very interestingly enough, I flew into the New York City. The training camp was in Pleasantville, New York. Um, and I landed at um, LaGuardia Airport, took a taxi uh, to the, uh, the New York City, and set out looking for Pace University. And I found Pace University, but it was a, you know, a three-story building. So I'm looking at that building, trying to figure out exactly, uh, this is July 4th, by the way, right. where they might practice football there. I called the contact at, um, at, uh, at Pace and at the Giants and no one answered. And I called for a couple hours. Finally, the head coach answered and he said, we're in Pleasantville, New York. Um, you'll need to 
the taxi over to uh, over to Pleasantville, check into the White Plains Hotel, and uh, we'll pick you up tomorrow. So that that's uh, to, to make a long story short. Uh, I started out as a as an intern, certified athletic trainer intern, helping the Giants out uh, while doing my job both at East Carolina and at Michigan State. So they were familiar with me. In 1980. Um, I was going to leave Michigan State to go to Arizona State uh, with then head coach Daryl Rogers as the, uh, a, 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 he became head coach and I was going to take the head athletic trainer position there. Uh, and I called the Giants and said, you know, enjoyed all these summers coming there and working with you guys, but I'm not, uh, I'm not going to come back. I'll probably be very busy in, uh, in Arizona. And the, uh, the athletic trainer says, we'll get back to you. And uh, maybe an hour later, I, I got a call from the owner, Wellington Mara, who said, don't go to Arizona State, uh, come to the Giants. Uh, we've been thinking about asking you to come here for several years. We knew you were uh, very active with your program at Michigan State, so we didn't want to disturb that, but we thought to have you here. Uh, so in 1980, I came to the Giants, and it's now 2021. And I've been here so from 76 19, to 2021. I've had an affiliation uh, with the Giants, uh, and I think that it, it's, uh, it's been a thrill of a lifetime. Well, what was it like to have the owner call you and tell you, we, we want you to come here to the Giants? Well, the, the Giants are a family organization, and yeah. so I'm well aware of Mr. Mara. Uh, he came to every practice, he engages with the interns, engaged at, um, while he was alive with uh, everyone in his organization. And, you know, organizations were not that big at that time. Yeah. Two athletic trainers, you know, uh, two equipment managers, uh, maybe about six coaches, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a front office of maybe 15 people. Uh, we've grown to over 200 folks in the organization, you know, um, and that excludes the marketing and, and development. So. Uh, it, it was wonderful to have him call. Um, it was something that I um, had thought about uh, and knew that I wanted to do. As a matter of fact, I told the people of Michigan State um, that, uh, you know what, I'm probably going to uh, be the head athletic trainer of the Giants. Uh, I, I felt the warmth and the, uh, and the gratitude for what they thought I was able to contribute to their program, uh, and I figured it was just a matter of time. So, so you've been there a long time now, um, and it doesn't seem like athletic trainers stay with one organization for a very long time. Uh, th there are some other notable head athletic trainers that I know that have been with the same organization for, for, a, for some period of time. Uh, but that doesn't, that seems like it's more atypical. It seems like coaching staff, sometimes when the coaching staff turns over, maybe they bring they bring their athletic training staff with them, or they bring people that they are they have relied on in the past in with them, uh, or organizations try and turn over uh, turn over the building and maybe you know try and uh, change the culture within the building and just bring in all new staff uh, for everything. How is it that you have managed over such a duration to to have that longevity with the Giants? What is it about the relationship? And what is it about you that uh, you have uh, the perception or the persona of, of being a, a very nice person, a very easy to get along person, person to get along with? Uh, yet when you look at the Giants over history, I mean, you've, you've had uh, coaches like Bill Parcells, who's notably not an easy guy to get along with, and, and you've had these coaches throughout your career, and yet you've somehow maintained the ability to get along with all of them, to have good relationships with them, and to have this longevity with the Giants. How, how has that happened? Well, Mike, you know, we've had some wonderful athletic trainers uh, in, in the National Football League, and some have moved on for various reasons, uh, as you pointed out. Uh, I think in terms of, uh, of what I think about as an athletic trainer at any position, uh, certainly confidence comes first, and, uh, and if you if confident at what you're doing, uh, then certainly you belong in that job. Uh, second is a commitment and a dedication to what it is you're doing. 
Uh, and then in all positions, I think relationships are very important. I've always had a relationship with my players, with my coach, uh, and certainly with, uh, with our players uh, and, and our owner. Um, I, I think it boils down to relationships. Um, but I, you can have all the relationships in the world, uh, but if, if you can't get the job done, if you're not committed to it, if you're not dedicated, um, and if, if you're not reliable, uh, then certainly folks might move on. Now, in sports, uh, not only in the NFL, but at colleges and universities, from time to time, athletic trainers are replaced uh, by the coach who'd like to have someone else. Um, I, I think that our profession uh, needs to grow beyond that, um, and, and we are. Um, very often, athletic trainers work for the student health service and universities. I think that's excellent. I think if there is a way that we can separate um, coaching and sports medicine, uh, I think we should, and we're, and we're getting there. Um, however, you know, teams in the NFL uh, are the 32 of them, and they can run their business any way they wish. Um, however, I think we have some very competent athletic trainers who've been asked to, to leave their positions. Uh, uh, who, who probably deserve to stay there, but it, it's been a business move. Um, I, I think it's it's wonderful that our athletic training group, PFATS, our membership is committed to continuing education. We drive that home all the time. Our members are committed to that. Uh, I think our scope is broadening with respect to performance and other areas. Um, I, I think over as we move forward, uh, you know, 21st century, um, I, I think the fact that we've become full-fledged medical departments um, and recognized so by the NFL and by the ownership, uh, that you'll see fewer and fewer uh, folks moving on uh, just because they wanted a different person. So you mentioned dedication, uh, relationships, uh, as, as being key components to the longevity that you've had with, with the Giants. Uh, you know, th those are important discussions that are going on in the athletic training profession on a regular basis, right? Uh, I, I think it's inherent in the nature of athletic training that you, it, it's demanding. It, it requires that you are there at odd hours, um, that, that, that you work long and you work hard hours. Um, but there's some uh, discussion about, you know, the, the quality of life of an athletic trainer. So you, you have you're, you're talking about relationships uh, and dedication. That dedication uh, takes a lot of time. It takes a lot. It, it takes more than 40 hours a week. And I, I know even some of the, the the athletic trainers in our region here in the secondary school struggle with the amount of time. Uh, that they spend at each school. Now, at your level, uh, when you first started, I, I could be wrong. Uh, you can hide, you can uh, shed some light on this, but when you first started with the Giants, it was it was probably a little less time involved than it is now. Now, your job is a year-round type of thing. When you first started, maybe it wasn't. So, how do you how do you reconcile? your dedication to the Giants, which has obviously, you know, had an impact on your longevity and the relationships that you have with the team and the players. Uh, how do you reconcile that with having a life outside of the Giants and outside of football and outside of athletic training? Well, Mike, I, the, the quality of life issue is, is very important. And, and, uh, and I've always considered that. I've always considered the fact that I need to make time for myself. I don't have a family, and, and that might have been a sacrifice that I've chosen uh, based on being married to the job. However, um, I think we all have to find a way in very taxing jobs, whether it be athletic training or anything else, uh, to have a life. And so living here in New York, obviously, uh, it's important for me to get to the theater. It's important for me to, uh, to dine out in New York and New Jersey and, and enjoy some of the finer things of life. Um, and it's important for me to travel. Um, given all the number of years I've been here, I've been to 73 countries in the world. So it really? tells you that there have been opportunities for me to do something other than sit at my desk yeah. and work 
up to sundown. Um, I think uh, I, I think that's a real challenge for people to do, but I think you must have a life, um, and you m must uh, have a fulfilling life. Uh, and if it's uh, just work, I think um, I think work uh, productivity declines. So uh, I found a way to do it. I think each person um, has to do that on their own and, and discover what it is uh, uh, that they can do to, to make their life more fulfilling, how not to burn out, and uh, and and how to get the job done. I use that term uh, commitment, and, and when I when I when I talk about commitment. I mean that um, when I'm at work, I'm committed. When I'm outside of work, I'm going to certainly take those calls that I need to take or make um, that are related to work. But but when I'm away from work, um, I take a deep breath and say, what am I going to do? Today? Who am I going to share my time with? How will I spend my time? Uh, I can tell you, I don't watch a lot of television. Um, Probably the uh, 11 o'clock news is about the only thing I see. Uh, of course, with uh, with the pandemic, I've discovered Netflix. So yeah. that's been <laughs> exciting. But yeah. I hope that's not contagious because I don't want to spend my time sitting in front of it. So you don't I'd, go? I'd rather spend it in Europe. Uh, Paris is one of my favorite cities. Um, or some new place. I was in Colombia, uh, the country of Colombia, uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, so there are plenty of other places I want to explore, including India. Uh, so uh, I, um, I, I'm committed, I'm dedicated, uh, but it's not the only thing in London. So you don't go home and watch ESPN? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely do. I turn on the sports channel. That's yeah, sure. yeah. And if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't cook either, right? If, if I remember correctly, you eat out all the time, right? You don't eat at home. Not all the time, and uh, of course, with this pandemic, I think I lost about 40 pounds. And so, people on Zoom calls said, "Are you sure Ronnie's okay? Would someone go over and check on him?" Yes, uh, dining is one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh, so, in this great career that you are are in with the Giants, uh, and the dedication and the relationship, you obviously have very strong relationships with a lot of the players. You had mentioned that, and. Um, you know, we mentioned at the outset that that picture hanging up above behind you is is Eli Manning. Uh, with all these relationships, let me ask you one question before I get to actually to what I was leading to. But um, you know, just off the top of my head, you, you know, you have uh, players like infamous players like Lawrence Taylor, you know, uh, Banks, those ki those types of guys. Why is Eli Manning the one that's hanging on your wall? Uh well, you know, Eli took us to so many Super Bowls, and, uh, and Eli is just a, a wonderful man. Um, that photo, that photo was given to me, or at least that painting was given to me. Um, and there are other folks who hang in this office, uh, as well as the great Wellington Mara. Yeah, uh, so give me an opportunity to be here. Uh, but uh, the fact that that picture hangs there uh, doesn't necessarily uh, prioritize how I think of him. Uh, uh, with respect to all the other uh, players, not just the great players, all of them. Um, you know, we have a cliche at the Giants uh, that says, once a Giant, always a Giant. And what that really means is um, we, we don't want to say former Giant. Uh, we we want to think that someone who comes and joins our family is always family, even though they might get traded to another team or they might be cut. Uh, but they can always come home here. And if they need uh, question, if they have questions about their health, they need referrals to doctors. Uh, I'm here for you. Uh, and, and so, once a giant, always a giant. Uh, it, it embodies um, family. And so, I see all of the folks in here as family. So, I, I generally don't pick one favorite. Often, I'm asked that question: Who's your favorite giant ever? Uh, we've had some great giants here, as you well know, um, including those that you mentioned. Um, Eli Manning and, and you know, Lawrence Taylor or LT, um, and Phil McConkey, who uh, was, was a, you know, had a career at the Naval Academy and then came to us to play. I mean, some of them don't think of those people as great, and you might not see his name hanging at, uh, among the banners, but a lot of great, wonderful, smart, dedicated um, participants. 
So with all those relationships and the time that you have spent with the Giants, was there any time someone came along in your career and tried to pick you away from the Giants? Oh, I've had opportunities to go uh, to other places early in my career. Has Not lately. I think they know that I'm, I'm planted here like a fixture now. Probably. Yes, I was asked. Uh, I thought the most honorable thing was uh, I was asked to come back to Michigan State, um, and I considered it. And the owner, I went for an interview, um, and uh, the owner said to me, don't let it come down to money. Well, quite frankly, at that time, I was so naive, I didn't know what it meant. All I know is that I love this team, and I love working for Wellington Mara, and that I, I was going to stay. Um, I, I got a raise out of it, but uh, <laughs> I had several opportunities to do other things, including to work at the National Football League, uh, to work in private practice um, and to, to go to uh, other teams. Um, Bill Parcells once asked me to go with him. You know, he had an opportunity to go to Atlanta, uh, to New England. I, I think he had about four different places. Uh, and I said, well, let me let me put it this way. You, you get the job and then I'll decide if I want to go. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, see, that goes back to what I was talking about. Sometimes a coach will take people that they like with them. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's kind of what I was alluding to there. But um, so if you weren't in athletic training, did, did you ever have a backup plan? I mean, what if, what if all this didn't work out for you? What, what would have been Ronnie Barnes' backup plan? What, what other career? Or was there, any, uh, was there a time when you thought, you know what, uh, this, this is really demanding? Um, Maybe I want to try something else. Maybe I want out of this. Is there was there any was there a backup plan or anything else that you had in the back of your head that maybe you would like to do? Well, Mike, from the very beginning, I've always enjoyed teaching, uh, and um, and I wanted to teach in an athletic training curriculum. So was that a backup plan if I decided to leave the NFL? No, uh, but teaching is, is is a passion, and so clearly um, that's something that I that I. I want that I wanted to do early in my career. Um, then, in terms of um, a backup plan, I uh, founded an a outpatient physical therapy company, Professional Sports Care, uh, uh, after probably around 1987. Uh, grew it from uh, three facilities in New Jersey uh, to about 60 in the tri-state area, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. Sold them to the, uh, as you say, infamous, the infamous Health South. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, that, that, was a, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, I never wanted to work in private practice uh, myself, uh, I, but I did own a facility, I took it public, and traded on stock exchange and, and sold it to Health South. So, How about uh, that? I did not know that. That's something, uh, that I've, I've done in my past. Um, uh, this is a, a, a real passion and certainly uh, it's a great stage uh, to be here at the Giants uh, to carry not only the message of athletic training, uh, but the message of, of the, the, the great men and women of the Professional Athletic Trainer Society, uh, the Athletic Trainers of the State of New Jersey. Um, it's a lot easier to um, if I have a message to give here in New York, it will appear in the Times, the News, uh, and the Post, and maybe even uh, in in uh, in Europe uh, or or even in China. Uh, so it's a magnificent stage, and I've always respected that, and uh, and so I'm going to stay here as long as I can. So if you were to, I don't even know if I dare to bring this up, but if you were to retire. Where would where where might we see Ronnie Barnes resurface? Because you don't you don't seem like the kind of guy that's going to retire and ride off into the sunset. That doesn't strike me as Ronnie Barnes ish. Well, I, I think there are many many opportunities to do some volunteering. You know, to give back. Um, I'm not sure that uh, retirement has crossed my mind. Uh, but if I were to retire, um, and folks always say you'll know when the right time to retire is. Um, I, I, that my heart will, will always be here. 
Um, and, uh, and I think I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. It's not, yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, not retiring often, um, lose uh, sight of what they're doing presently. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I have the retirement gene in me. I, I think I will be doing something in this line of work for a very long time. Cause I, I have a passion about athletic training as well. And, and as you know, in the, sports emergency care component of that in particular, just the uh, having some sort of impact on keeping athletics safe so that people can reap all the benefits of athletic participation without having to worry as much about some of the consequences. And that's just, I just don't see myself not doing that in some capacity uh, at, 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 at any point. So I think I, I think there becomes a time when you've finished your race, you know, and you can look back and say, I ran a good race, I finished my course, and yeah. I'm ready to do something else. Um, yeah. Probably if I were retired, I would travel uh, more extensively and do some of those things that, uh, that being in, engaged in sports does not afford you the opportunity to do. I hear folks who, re who retire talk about uh, what a wonderful time it is in the fall. Uh, I have a place in North Carolina, uh, and yeah. uh, yeah. when I come there for eight days a year at the beach, they say, oh, you ought to come here in September and October. It's beautiful. I'm thinking, well, maybe they'll bring my uh, coffin by and right. take me to the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, your perspective is if the sun is shining inside the stadium, right? It's a beautiful day because the sun is shining and blue sky. You don't get to see the trees, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So in your career as, as uh, well, not just in the NFL, but uh, in your career as an athletic trainer, let me ask you, what's, what was your scariest moment? When, when did you, were, was there a time when you truly feared for the health of an athlete that you were looking at on the field or during practice? Mike, I've always had a lot of confidence in my skill set uh, and tried to be prepared. Um, and used um, folks like you to help me uh, be prepared. So I have to tell you that I, I've never had a scary moment. Now that can occur. Obviously, if a, a player is in a life-threatening situation, airways compromised, or um, uh, a severe bleeding situation where you know we we can't stop the bleeding and uh, and, um, and we've got to call for back up and just a paramedic. Uh, those, are, those are challenging times and those are times that you prepare for and I think you prepare for them so you won't be scared uh, because I think that in those emergent situations, a cool head, a level head, and the ability to not only uh, recall and utilize uh, all of the skills that you but also utilizing all those people around you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually you're not in that situation alone. You have um, very well-trained assistants and associates. Um, and as, as a head athletic trainer, often it's your job to, to kind of make sure that it's cool, that it's calm, it's sufficient, and that you do everything competently. And that, that, that the, whatever it is, the, the scary situation, Whatever that is, that um, that, you, that you do it with a professional. So clearly, no scary moments. Some uh, interesting times, you know, going to a field with a player face down um, and perceivably not breathing, but with a pulse. The pulse is a good thing. Right. Uh, it's uh, it, that I, for some that could be scary. For me, that's a challenge of okay. But our our training has to kick in, and um, and Mike Sandoma's prepared us for this moment. Yeah, so, I, yeah. not scary, my friend. Not scary at all. Uh, it can be very challenging. Well, yeah, I, th I think it. At that point, you have to think of this as okay. This is a. This is a challenging time, but it's our training and our staff that is the mediating factor here. So if we weren't as well-trained as we are and we weren't as ready, calm, cool-headed 
as we are, this person could not walk away from this, but we're going to give this person the best chance of walking away. And that, that's kind of a driving force for, for me, and I think that's what you're alluding to is you have prepared for that event to give that person the best chance of walking away from that instance if you, know, if, if you keep your heads about you. Absolutely. And it, go back again to 2010 when I first had the opportunity to address PFATS for the first time. And I, at that stage, I know the NFL had taken great strides in, in uh, emphasizing emergency action plans for the teams. And, and each team has its own emergency action plan and, and responsibilities for that emergency action plan. And I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, just about the time I started to get involved with that was about the time that the league thought, let's add airway management physicians to the sideline. And then from that became uh, unaffiliated neural consultants and then VTMLs or visiting team medical liaisons. So the NFL over, I would say, the last decade has really gone to great pains to go a step beyond just an emergency action plan. I would argue that on any given game day, the NFL has a f operating trauma center on the sideline for all intents and purposes. Um, so what can the rest of us learn or, or what should we take away? What, what should the rest of the profession take away from that? Is, is, is the NFL uh, in a leadership role as far as emergency response and emergency action planning? What, what should we take away from the efforts that the, the great efforts that the NFL has made over the last decade or so? Well, let me just say the NFL has tremendous resources. So what's done at the NFL uh, can't always be done uh, around the country uh, because we're talking about high school sports, we're talking about youth sports, uh, we're talking about small universities, large universities. Um, but clearly, um, one of the things that I've always said is if uh, there is someone better trained than myself in an emergent situation, I defer to the last train. Now, um, clearly, we train with you so that we can be prepared. But we have paramedics who uh, often work uh, in some very difficult situations. And as you know, you uh, they train with you. So I'm very confident of having them around. You talk about airway management folks. Well, clearly the paramedics are trained to manage airway. You've trained the athletic trainers to manage airway. But to have someone who's even higher trained uh, makes those moments, as you say, less scary. Um, uh, the VTML, visiting uh, uh, medical liaisons um, with respect to medication, crash cards. So we have a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, and, uh, and yes, uh, I think everywhere that could have that, great. Um, uh, I, I'm not of the opinion there are too many folks there um, when in, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a crash call or in an emergency situation. Um, we train them where to be, where to stand, when to react, who to respond to, who the leaders are. And that's something that you do a great job with. You, you, you know that we have, we could have as many as 20 people. And we have certain signals about who we're calling to the field. But all those people, based on the training that they've done with you and, and with others, uh, understand their role. And, uh, and, and, it, and it, it's, it makes for a very efficient um, way of managing uh, with a crisis. So um, I, I don't think I would go to so far to say as the NFL has made this a model and others could take a look at it. But I think that um, don't be afraid of having some experts on the sidelines, wherever it might be, to assist you. As you know, we have spine surgeons uh, on the sidelines and, and, and neuro and orthopedic. So those can be very important people uh, if we have been surgical from our spine injury uh, as we evaluate them on the field, as we look at uh, paresthesias or whatever that we might be dealing with. Uh, at, at, at that moment, um, uh, but I 
can't overemphasize the fact that whoever is going to be involved in an emergency situation should train with the athletic trainers and with the group that they're going to be responsible for. So that everyone knows their role, understands what they would do in that situation, and be ready when they're called upon uh, to fulfill that. Yeah, obviously I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> That, that that's right that's the my career is predicated on on that that comment so you you had a a unique path somewhat to to the NFL uh, at a time when there wasn't a clear defined path for an athletic trainer to become a head athletic trainer in the NFL now there are obviously different ways to become a head athletic trainer but i what what is the most typical path if if you if you were if if i was now a senior athletic training student and i said mr barnes uh i want to be uh, a head athletic trainer in the nfl wh where do i go how do i do that wh what is what is the most traditional path as of today to get to your position well, Mike, I don't think there's a traditional path, but I think that uh, as in all uh, positions that um, have heavy responsibility, experience counts. Uh, and so frequently folks say to me, well, I'd like to come to the NFL. Um, and they say, I'm a senior in a program. Uh, what I say is, uh, if you'd like to go to the NFL, our business is football. Well, the best thing you can do is get a job as an assistant athletic trainer. At a, at a football school, somewhere where you're gonna get football experience. Now, does that mean that folks who uh, take care of basketball or take care of, of soccer or other sports aren't qualified? No, we have, we have a supremely qualified athletic trainers in all disciplines in school, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in our business, we're looking, say, uh, we're gonna look at the, at the Michigan States. We're gonna look uh, at the Arizona States. We're going to look at UCLA, USC. We're going to look there. But we're also going to look at some Division II and III programs. But I, I think it's very important that if you're going to work in football and make that your life's work, uh, that you uh, have some experience in taking care of football injuries and dealing with football athletes. Um, uh, very often, uh, folks come to our league because they have become, they've been interns and we've identified them as, um, as excellent candidates, they're bright, um, they're inquisitive, uh, they have good skills, uh, they're open to continue, uh, continuing their learnings, uh, and they often become uh, what we call a, a second or third athletic trainer. And some of those um, wind up ascending into the position of a head athletic trainer in the NFL. Um, some go back to a, a university and become a head athletic trainer there, and some go to other teams as as head NFL athletic trainers. So uh, obviously that's one route is to come in for an internship, get hired by a team, uh, and then of course uh, continue your learning uh, and your experience and, and move elsewhere. Um, but I, I can also tell you that there are wonderful athletic trainers at the college level um, that, I, uh, that I would never exclude uh, if I were interviewing for an NFL athletic trainer. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the market's wide open uh, in, many, in many respects. Um, and education, training, experience, those are the most important factors. Um, uh, and I, I often say, if you want to work in the NFL, you know, uh, it's pretty big time. So I, I often say, try to go to a big time program. I don't know. I, I guess a better use of words would be, you can get to a power five uh, school as an athletic trainer. That might be someplace we'd go and look for an assistant athletic trainer or even for an athletic trainer. Uh, but each one of these jobs, there are 32 of them. Each one of them runs a little bit differently, um, and, and, uh, but I think we're all looking for about the same thing, someone experience and taking care of it. So one, one way might be to, to become a, a, 
a camp intern, right? You, you have camp interns, seasonal interns. Um, what would, if, if I was at a curriculum program getting ready to graduate and I wanted one of your uh, camp interns or maybe I wanted a seasonal internship, what are you looking for in me that would indicate that I'm a good candidate for, well, the first step is always the camp intern, right? Come, come and help us out with camp. If we like you, if you demonstrate some of those qualities that you were just alluding to, then maybe we invite you back as a seasonal intern. So what are the types of things that you're looking for in me that would indicate to, to you that you would be a good fit for a, a camp or seasonal intern at the Giants? Well, Mike, currently we have about uh, 250 applications. Yeah. By, of, um, uh, by the end of this month, we'll probably have about 350, maybe more. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the first thing is, is a CV, you know, a resume. Tell us what you've been doing. Um, where, where you work, a um, little bit about your scholar, uh, uh, your scholarship uh, in terms of participation in sports medicine activities. Uh, so we're gonna, we, we look at those uh, CVs and resumes very carefully. Um, the next is a recommendation um, from those that you've worked with. Because essentially we're just looking at it on paper, you know, uh, and so, a phone call from uh, an athletic trainer or supervising athletic trainer is, is very important. And then once they get here, um, what we're really looking for is, uh, is, is their real interest in the profession, because often we invite them back a second year. Um, their uh, ability to work and work hard and, and, um, and, uh, and really be attentive to all aspects of the job. Uh, as 24/7, as long as they're, yeah. you know, uh, that that's so very important. Um, and uh, I, I think more than anything else, uh, do they have the passion for it, and do they have compassion? And when I say compassion, you know, uh, do they know how to talk to athletes, and, and do they have some compassion and some empathy for what these athletes are going to do? Those are those are important whether you're a student or whether you're a full-time person. Um, my, my clear thoughts is that the NFL is one place to work, but there are so many other rewarding places to work other than here. I think if that's your goal, set it and, 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 and shoot for it, but recognize um, uh, that you can get tremendous experience at, at certain high schools, certain colleges, and even in some private setting. Um, so uh, folks who are looking for internships from us, they're going to send us a, uh, a resume or a CV. As a student, you know, usually they are not too extensive. Uh, but we're going to review that carefully. Uh, we're going to make some calls uh, with respect to uh, folks that are on their resume. Um, and we're always thrilled when people call us about students. But I've got this great student, and this is what I think um, makes him, sets him or her apart. And and while I'm on the him and her pronouns, I, I think um, you recognize that there are a tremendous number of women in our profession today. I think that's wonderful. And many of them um, have done internships in the NFL and gone on to become an assistant in it someday, I hope. Uh, very soon, we'll have a, a woman as a head athletic trainer in the National League. So it's open uh, to all, to men, women, uh, and to all minorities. I, I know uh, just in my experience working with the various teams in the league, there are a number of female athletic trainers that would step into a head athletic trainer role pretty readily, I think, that, that, have, yeah, that have that qualification to be, to be able to handle that, without a doubt. And our mission in PFATS is to increase that. Yeah. And, uh, and we're working diligently to do that. So keeping on uh, informing students a little bit, um, and I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but tell me uh, a little bit as, as we kind of wrap things up, bring things full circle here a little bit. Tell me a little bit about the rigor 
of, of your day. So, for example, some may think, well, the Super Bowl's over. So all of the athletic trainers in the NFL just all went on break until training camp starts, right? So NFL athletic trainers aren't doing anything from now until July, and that's just not the case. So, so what happens now? What, the Super Bowl's over. Playoffs are... And yeah. you recognize that if you're not in it, it it's not important to you. Uh, but what you really have are the injuries that occurred during the season. So those uh, those those players who continued to play through through the season but needed some kind of surgery. Okay, uh, that can be as many as uh, sometimes it can be as many as 20 people who are having things done, um, whether it's to correct a, a hand problem, stabilize an ankle, uh, clean out a, a degenerative arthritic knee. But all those folks, as soon as the season's over, uh, have their surgeries or begin uh, a rehabilitation program. And uh, as, as often as we can, we have them stay here with us. And that's why we have such large staffs and staffs that are growing in size. Because we like to keep the players with us so that we can rehab. Frequently, they'll go out to outpatient uh, physical therapy centers and come back to us. Uh, that's something we work on. Uh, and that's on our calendar. And, and that's a very important thing that we do. Next comes uh, preparation for the draft and getting ready uh, to, uh, to add uh, new players. Generally, we have a combine. This year, um, we're not going to have a combine um, the way we've had it in the past, but we will have virtual uh, exams and we will bring 150 players uh, to Indianapolis. Uh, the commissioner and the NFL put me in charge of organizing virtual medical, uh, orthopedic and medical exam. Logistics of how that will occur. So that, that's what I'm working on. Um, but all the other athletic trainers around the country, uh, they're beginning to assemble all of the names of uh, folks that are going to be involved in this draft, probably 338 folks. Um, and they're going to begin to look at the internal information that, that's been collected by their scouts uh, and that's public sourced information about these athletes, just their medical information. Uh, and they're going to prepare uh, to uh, give an assessment or grade uh, to all those players to determine uh, the risk uh, for their team. So it's a kind of a, a risk assessment of, uh, of players involved in, in the investment of, uh, of their team. In uh, but there are also um, on-field training activities that occur. Uh, in early April, the players come back uh, to start weight training uh, and to begin some running uh, and then followed by those on-field uh, on training activities. Uh, for some programs, they may have uh, too many camps, in particular if they have a, a new head coach, so they'll have a, uh, too many camps. Um, We'll also have a, a camp where just rookies come. So they're, they're, football is year-round uh, in the NFL. Um, and that's different than when you started, right? When you started, football wasn't year-round. Very much different um, yeah. uh, than when I started. But there's a lot of activity that occurs between the last whistle uh, and, um, and the opening day. Uh, next September. So what's it, what's it like? What's it like on opening day when you're standing in MetLife Stadium? How, how many people how, how many people does MetLife Stadium hold? Well, I, and we must hold 75 or 80,000 people um, and uh, it's sold out. That's a great feeling. Yeah. A lot of work that goes into that. So, uh, yeah. so just so you know, one of these days, if I was to consider retiring or scaling back, I've already told my wife, one of the things that I'm going to do is be a seasonal intern. So, so don't be surprised if my resume comes across your desk one of these days and I'm going to apply for that seasonal internship because I, I want to be there one of these days. That's, that's one thing that I, I just love the game of football. I'll, I'll put that out there. I, I love everything about the game of football. Well, that's I, excellent. We have I, no age discrimination, so you'll fit right <laughs> in. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I do love everything about uh, competition, generally speaking. I just, I love to see people competing, whether it's uh, 
downhill skiing, whether it's soccer, whether it's cross country, uh, but I do have a special spot for football, no, no question about it. And one of the things I'm gonna do before I walk away from what I'm doing now is I'm going to be, I, I want to experience that at some point to be to be on the sideline in the biggest game. So uh, I'll I'll be sending a resume out at some point. So <laughs> I think I think some of us stay in this game because we like going to the game. Yeah, our commitment is to healthcare. Uh, but that's 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 just the fringe, you know. That's yeah. the benefit. Yeah, uh, Mike. You know, uh, I often think that uh, that those of us in this profession. Do it primarily because we enjoy helping others. We ask an athletic trainer, "Why do you Why do you do this?" Uh, and they they'll tell you that it, you know, taking an injured player, um, being involved in the rehabilitation, uh, managing their expectation, dealing with the psychological aspects of you know of recovery. Is this going to turn out well for me? Uh, the encouragement, the coaching. Uh, the 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 rehabilitation skills, all of those things, um, kind of play out when that player can get back on the field. And most athletic trainers will tell you that's a wonderful moment, whether they were involved directly in the rehabilitation, or whether they were on the staff and and offered encouragement, whether they were helped them get to a doctor's appointment or answered a question. Everybody in the athletic training room is pulling for that injured athlete to get back to play. And, um, and, and that's a great feeling. And that's why we keep doing it, you know, because we're so good at it yeah. that, um, uh, well, and sports medicine is so good these days. We, years ago, we didn't have some of the surgeries that we, that we had. We often um, couldn't recognize what was going on. MRIs played a great role in that. Yeah. Fellowship trained uh, physicians play a great role in kind of understanding that if we can manage something early, then it won't be a problem later. Uh, and then the great uh, uh, training that athletic trainers are, are receiving. Uh, I'm just amazed um, at the scope of knowledge of, the, of, our, of our most recent graduates of our programs. I, I think those uh, professors are doing a marvelous job. Are some of them smarter than me? Absolutely. Can I learn from them? Absolutely. And that's what's so wonderful about this profession. We yeah. learn from each other, and we're, we're, we're making it better than it was um, when we came in. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, you know, when I came in, I wouldn't want to sit for the exam now. I mean, the, the wealth of knowledge, the body of scholarship and knowledge that athletic trainers are responsible for now, uh, even in my career, uh, I, I would not want to have to sit for that exam now. It's, it's a considerable larger body of knowledge that they're responsible for having an, a command of. Yeah. Well, Mike, I've seen you teach, so I don't think there'd be a problem. I, I don't know. I... <laughs> uh, and as we start to look at recertification, uh, I think you'll hit the ball out of the park. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm not, so, I'm, I'm not as confident as you. Hopefully it doesn't, I don't have to do that. <laughs> but look, uh, Ronnie, I want to thank you for for taking the time. Uh, I know you have a busy schedule and, and I know you uh, are asked to do a lot of these types of things. So I, I really appreciate you taking some time to visit with us. Um, and, and let me say, uh, let me be the first to say, I, I know you're already uh, a Hall of Fame member for the National Athletic Trainers Association. I know you're already there and have been there for quite a while, right? When, when were you inducted into that? I don't yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me be the first to say if the Pro Football Hall of Fame ever decides they're going to start inducting athletic trainers, that I think you're a first ballot all the way around. And, and I think you have my vote and a majority of the other athletic trainers in, that are out there practicing today. So uh, with that, I, I, again, I, I couldn't appreciate more that, that you took the time to spend with, with us. And I certainly look forward to hopefully coming down to East Rutherford and, and, and training with you guys again this year in person. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. So, I look forward to it as well, Mike, and thank you so much. And thank you for your program. Um, uh, Sports Master Concepts does a marvelous uh, job in teaching and training. Uh, and, uh, keep up. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.